Uh, well, we're working through a series of messages that I'm calling Four Things You Need to Know About Jesus. We've already looked at uh, Luke chapter 7 where Jesus healed the, the servant of the centurion. And we saw that Jesus admired that man's faith. Then last week we saw how he had compassion on a widow who had lost, obviously, her husband, but also her only son. This week I want to talk about the concept of doubt. It's not an easy concept to talk about. It's something that in many cases Christians are very subtly, not, not openly, but discouraged from uh, ventilating, from, from sharing that they have doubts. Because the Bible tells us that we are supposed to live by faith. But you know, it's difficult for believers to agree on what that means. Did you know that there were five different councils of churches where leaders were brought from all over the world between the year 180 and 500 with the express purpose of defining what faith was? And these councils produced these documents that we call creeds. You may have heard of some of them. There's the Apostles' Creed. There's the Creed of Nicaea. The Creed of Chalcedon. The Nicene Creed. And the Athanasian Creed. And each one gets more and more complicated as history progresses. When you get to that uh, Athanasian Creed, you almost have to have a PhD just to read the thing. It's a very complicated document. Because they had a hard time agreeing on the, the core issues of faith. They had a hard time defining them. And they, they really wanted to get a good, clear, intellectual definition of faith. Unfortunately, faith, as we know from practical experience, is more than just intellectual assent. It's more, it's not less than, but it's more than just knowing the Bible stories. Now, the Bible stories are essential. We have a whole program where we teach the children the Bible stories. These are important, but they're not all that's included in faith. It's important that we get the right answers in our Sunday school lessons. Many of our um, quarterlies have a, a workbook where we can fill in the blanks, and it's important that we know how to fill those in but faith is more than just getting the right answer in the quarterly. Faith is more than just knowing the historical truths. There's some benefit to knowing the history of the church. But there's more to it than that. Because at the end of the day, the creeds aren't going to help you sleep at night when things don't go right. All of us know from experience that there are going to be times that we are going to have doubts about our faith. It's difficult sometimes to stay focused on our faith when things don't go right. Remember, what is it now, 11 years ago? No, more than that, 20, 21 years ago. When the airplanes hit the Twin Towers? This is the anniversary. Do you remember how the people responded to that? The very next Sunday, the largest attendance in churches across the country for decades. Not just churches, though. Synagogues and mosques also had their largest attendance in recent history. People were doubting most of those people were actually secularists who had put their faith in the government or in society to make, get things right, and it wasn't working. And so they decided they'd better go look and see if there's something better out there. Sometimes believers have similar doubts. When we go to the altar and we say, I do, and the person we were standing with didn't, that's a real challenge. When we work the way we were taught and we, we earn an income and we invest our money and all of a sudden the economy crashes and we lose everything, we begin to wonder, 
does our faith work? And these doubts start popping up. But you know what? We're in good company. We're in real good company because no less than John the Baptist had doubts. No less than John the Baptist wondered, is this working? And we can learn three things from John's response. I'm sorry, from Jesus' response to John's doubts. And the th three things will help us to face our doubts as well. Will bolster our faith. The first one is that doubts happen to the best of us. That passage was read to us here just a moment ago, and it was read out of the New International Version, which is an excellent version. I hope that you guys are using uh, the NIV or something similar to it. I happen to read out of the English Standard Version, not because I think it's a, a better translation or more useful translation, but for me, it's easier to cross-reference between the ESV and the Greek to see where the, the original languages fit with what's being said in the, the new uh, translations. I'm going to read out of the English Standard Versions, and you'll notice that there's not much difference. It's actually very much the same translation. Starting in verse 18, it says, The disciples of John reported these things to him. Now, I'll stop before we go any further. What are they reporting? They go back, they, they're watching Jesus and they go back to John and report that he's been, uh, you know, gracious to a Roman, which would have been a red flag to the average Jew because the Romans were the foreigners who were oppressing them. And most of the Jews would have said, well, if, if something bad happens to a Roman, that's good for us. And why is Jesus lending aid and comfort to the enemy? They probably also reported the, the story that we saw last week where he was compassionate to a widow. The legalists must have hated that. Did you ever something think of that? The legalists in Jesus' day probably thought to themselves, well, she must have been a terrible sinner to lose her husband and her son both. She's getting what she deserves. She, she made her bed. She needs to lie in it. Why would the Messiah have compassion on somebody like that? John's disciples reported this to John, and John called two of them and sent them to Jesus. It goes on to say that here at the middle of verse 18. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. No less than John the Baptist heard the story of Jesus and wondered, is he really the Messiah? John, who had seen Jesus baptized... And saw the Spirit descend on him like a dove and just kind of melt into him. John, who had probably visited temple with Jesus every year and heard his brothers complain about how perfect my big brother is. John, who God the Father had spoken to and said, the one you see when you baptize is the one who's coming. And John still wondered, is it him? Now, in this particular lesson, we learn something from what Jesus doesn't do. Because I could, if it had been me, I, I just have to admit, if it had been me, I'd have, I'd have sent those messengers back to John saying, you dummy, you saw me baptized. How could you doubt? But he didn't. Instead, he stopped and healed 
people with diseases. That word in Greek is exactly that, diseases. Those people who are ill at ease because of illness. He healed those with plagues. The uh, literal translation for that word is scourges. People who have uh, discomforts. People who have uh, things that aren't going well in their life. And when I picture that, I picture uh, things that are not really disease-oriented, but maybe they've had a past physical trauma or they've had uh, some kind of emotional issue going on. And Jesus is healing that. And then he casts out demons. And he even gives sight to the blind. Now, every one of those is an Old Testament prophecy that... Messiah would fulfill. So instead of chastising John, he just redoubles his efforts and demonstrates all the things that the Old Testament said the Messiah would do. And then he says, blessed is he who is not offended by me. Some of your Bibles might say, who doesn't stumble because of me. The Greek word is scandalon. And we get our English word scandal from it. But the way the Greeks use that word, it was a, a stumbling stone. Usually it was a stone that somebody stubbed their toe against and tripped. Might be a, a root in a tree or something else where it causes them to lose their balance and have to struggle to get their feet back under them. Jesus gently encourages John and says, now, don't doubt. Even if I don't do the things you expect me to do, don't doubt. Even if I don't behave or answer in the way that you would like me to, remember, I still accept you. And that's a good lesson for us, too. The passage goes on beyond that. And in the next paragraph, we learn that Jesus doesn't forget the efforts that we put into his kingdom as well. Let me read that for you, starting at verse 24. It says, when John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowd concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothes and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom, the kingdom of God, is greater than he. John had been open and verbalized his doubts about Jesus. Are you the one? And Jesus points to the crowd who have seen this. They've heard this. These people have come and, and questioned whether Jesus is really the Messiah. And Jesus sent back a, what should have been a satisfying answer. Jesus looks to the crowd and says, what did you go out to see when, Jesus, when, when John was out there baptizing? And he brings them down to the point of saying he was a prophet. Not just any prophet. He was the fulfillment of another prophet's prophecy. The quote in verse 27 there is from Malachi. It's in Malachi chapter 3. And it's a messianic prophet that says that before Jesus comes, before the Messiah arrives, someone will come and prepare the way for him so that people are ready for him to arrive. He's done a tremendous work. He's contributed to the kingdom of God. But then Jesus throws in this phrase that is a little bit mysterious. He says, among those born of women... None is greater than John, but those who are in the kingdom of God are even greater than John. It's a little bit confusing because, frankly, all of us are born of woman. All of us had a mother. So how can anyone be greater than John? 
Well, John was the last of, the, of a series of prophets. And they came to prepare. They came in anticipation for what God was going to do. That someday God was going to do something in this world that was earth-changing. And when that happens, something's going to happen to the human race. So that something even greater than what John has done is possible. See, John lived in the time of expectation. But people in the kingdom are living in the fulfillment of that expectation. When a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ, it's not just sprinkling a little extra Jesus on the top of your life and going on with what was before. The Bible says that person is born again. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that that person is a new creation. Something all that was old is gone. Something new has come. Another way to translate that new creation is a new species. A different kind of human being. Someone who can live and fulfill everything that the kingdom brings. Something that John will not have the experience of because he simply just won't live that long. What Jesus is saying here is that John did something great. And his doubts don't belittle that. But the people who believe in Jesus and are born again can do something even greater. And our doubts won't stop that. The last thing we can learn from Jesus' reaction to, G to John this morning starts at verse 31 where we see how the critics treated John and Jesus. Jesus says there, to what shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating, I'm sorry, has come eating and no bread and drinking no wine. And you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by all her children. It's just like today. If you live differently than everybody else, people are going to criticize you. They, they accused John of losing his mind because he lived out in the wilderness and he dressed funny and he ate funny food. They accused Jesus of being a sinner because he hung out with the wrong kind of people and he ate all the time. And basically, they accused him of being a party animal. And they didn't like that because that's not what Messiah was supposed to be. John had doubts. The people had doubts about John and Jesus. But the last line is the key. Wisdom will be told by what she produces. And Jesus is saying, you're fitting in, you're accepting the common wisdom is not going to produce for you what you want. People who are willing to risk putting their faith in something new in their perspective, in Jesus Christ, are going to gain. So we learn that doubt happens to the best of us. We learn that Jesus will not forget, cancel all the good things that we have contributed to his kingdom if we suddenly have doubts, if life suddenly changes and we have a hard time following. And when people criticize us for our faith, that shouldn't cause us to doubt that we've made a wrong decision. Jesus is still worth following. In fact, I could boil this down to one statement that can be made in two different ways. One that applies to then and one that applies to now. In, G in John's life, Jesus accepted John the Baptist despite his struggles. Despite his openness with his struggles. And Jesus still accepts those who struggle today. Those who wonder, is it worth it? Should I continue? Have I made a mistake? Jesus still accepts. And this helps us. 
It helps us to do what may be the most difficult thing for a believer in Jesus Christ to be. That word is steadfast. Now, there are several Greek words translated steadfast. The one that I'm thinking about today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. That verse says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Paul has just been talking about the resurrection. Some people doubted that the resurrection ever happened, that Jesus was ever resurrected at all. They doubted that a resurrection would happen for the average believer. But Paul corrected that in this chapter. And he said, Jesus' resurrection is, is vital and sure, and the promise of the resurrection of the average believer is true. And because of that, you can remain steadfast. What does steadfast mean? Steadfast means immovable. Nobody can shake you. Nothing can make you give up. He goes on to say, it's always abounding in the work of the Lord. The works of faith that he's given us to do. And if we do that, if we stay steadfast, we know that our efforts are not going to be forgotten. Now, there's several things that the Bible would encourage us to be steadfast in. The first is devotions. Devotions are that, is that time of the day when we set aside uh, to go and read the Bible and pray and fellowship with God. And sometimes that is the hardest thing on planet earth to do. I think every believer has to plan their own devotional time according to their lifestyle demands. For me, it's my goal to read the Bible every year, the whole Bible, every word. But I can't read the Bible every day of the week. I can't read the Bible every day of the year. On Sunday mornings, there's uh, so much going on that there's no time to set aside and read. Uh, here in the next, uh, not next week, but the week after, I'm going to be gone for three days. Uh, I have a conference that I've been invited to go to, and I'm going to be going to that. And so on those three days, rather than my own personal devotions, I will attend the devotions that the conference provides. And so that's three days out of the year I'm not able to go to my own system. And so I have designed for myself a system where I can read the whole Bible in 220 days out of the year. I usually get done somewhere in the middle of December. I start January 1st every year. That may not work for you. It may be better for you to follow the, the guidelines in something like Our Daily Bread, the devotional that you can get online, or, or something else that you find online, or simply divide the number of chapters in the Bible and read enough to read that in whatever time period you've decided. It's important that we take along with that time, the time to pray. And I'll tell you what, it, for me at least, when I sit down to pray, that's when all the distractions hit my mind. That's when all the things that need to be done come crowding in, or all the things that didn't get done yesterday. And you know, after a few years, you look at the world around you, and you've been reading the Bible, and you've been praying, and sometimes it's hard to see that anything's different. And you get to wondering, is it worth it? The Bible's answer would be to be steadfast. Continue. Because your labor, your efforts are not in vain. Another suggestion for steadfastness would be godliness. In um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, Peter gives a list of, of characteristics of a believer who's growing, and one of them is steadfast, is, is godly, uh, godliness. And uh, the word in Greek is eusebia. It's a, a contraction between the word good and the word piety, pushed together. And the Greeks used that word to describe the pagans when the pagans would be so conscious so nervous about the nearness of their gods that it changed the way they acted. And Peter is suggesting that same kind of consciousness of God's presence, God's reality, God's pleasures and dislikes, that it changes the way we behave to where we begin to be described as godly. But boy, I tell you, when you look at 
the rest of the world, you begin to feel like you stand out, like you're a freak of some kind, like, like this really isn't worth it. And the Bible would say, remain steadfast. Your efforts will not be forgotten. Perhaps the hardest is witnessing. Man, there are people in this world that every chance they get, they share what they know about Jesus. They tell what Jesus has done for them. They tell what the Bible says about Jesus. They point people to Jesus. Every chance they get, every stranger, every friend, everybody in between, they're constantly pointing people back to Jesus. And after years and years, they see very little change. Now, to be honest with you, I think some of us are too close to the forest to see the trees. But it's difficult to keep that enthusiasm up, that, that conviction that this is right, this is appropriate. The Bible would say, be steadfast. Continue to share. It's worth the effort. It's like John, it's not always going to be easy. Sometimes it's not going to feel good. There, trust me, folks, there are, I don't know how many days out of an average week where I could say, you know, I could sleep for two more hours, but I want to get up and get in the Bible. And maybe you do your devotions at the other end of the day. Boy, I'd sure like to go to bed early tonight. It's been a long, hard day. It doesn't always feel good to sit down and open that Bible up, but it's worth it. Other people are going to pick on you. People are going to make jokes about the way you use your time and the way you talk and the way you react and the things you do and don't do. The Bible says it's worth it. It may be actually hard work. Uh, one of the things that we're uh, leaning towards is um, presenting a teaching on how to lead your neighborhood to Christ. It's not as scary as it sounds, folks. But it's not going to be effortless. It's going to take a little bit of work to reach people for Jesus in the city of Enid. It'll be worth it. Christ will remember. Jesus will make it worth it. The promise is your labor will not be in vain. That's a promise. The Spirit inspired it. It's true that what we put into it will not be forgotten. It'll be worth it. So the question might arise, since I started this with a, uh, a little history on the creeds, what is the basis of faith? What are the, the, the absolute, non-negotiable basics of faith? I've uh, concluded that there are four things that a person needs to know. The first is that God exists. I think that there's a lot of evangelists out there that are trying to convince people they need to be saved from something they don't believe exists. God exists. Um, Hebrews 11.6 says that anyone who would please God must believe that He exists and rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So that's the starting point. God is real. The second point is believing that our sins have put us in need of a Savior. Anybody who looks at this world and says it is as it ought to be probably needs a little medicate, medical help on the side because this world is not what it ought to be. And most of us, if we're honest, when we look at ourselves, we know that not every thought, not every word, not every deed is in alignment with what pleases God. And that separated us. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, it says that your sins have separated you from your God. And there's no way to bridge that gap. There's nothing we can do. We need a Savior. And we need to consider Jesus that Savior. Based on His own statements, His death on the cross paid the price so that we can no longer be condemned, but have eternal life. John 3, 17 and 18 are the verses for that one. Jesus is the only one. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. The word 
and the, in that verse, excludes everything else. If you were a Greek speaker, that would be so blatant it wouldn't need explanation. You, in fact, some translators put the word only in there. I'm the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Jesus is the one we have to turn to for our salvation. The next point is the one that I think we need to emphasize more in the churches in the United States. The next point is to do what Jesus did. When Jesus called people, he didn't say, sprinkle a little bit of me on the top of your life and everything will be okay. Jesus said, follow me. And that's where the discipleship comes in. Where we rub elbows with each other and the word of God to the point where we begin to change into the image of Jesus. Spending time with him and allowing him to be our Lord. In fact, at one point Jesus said, unless you pick up your cross daily and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Everything else is negotiable. I can get on one side of the platform or the other and defend eternal security. I can get on one side of the platform or the other and defend all the highfalutin theological words, the hypostatic union and the trinity and all the other things that are so hard to understand and come to agreement on. Anybody who can say yes to those four things has started. Because that's where it all starts. That's where we begin to receive the acceptance that Jesus gives. He's promised it. One more verse for you this morning. Write down Hebrews 13.5. I will never abandon you. I will never forsake you. That's a promise. Jesus has promised. And that's really what living by faith is. Trusting Jesus that he'll keep his promises. And he will. No matter how strong your doubts are. If you're still leaning on his promises. He still accepts you. 